Welcome. I'm Dr. Anita Sanchez, and this is the Sacred Gifts Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. I'm Aztec and Toltec, which is in central Mexico, and I was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri. And for the last 50 plus years, I have been living in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains on the unceded territories of the Cheyenne, Ute, and Arapaho, and I'm grateful to them, and they are still here. I also uh, mentioned to you, I'm a, I'm a grandmother, an auntie, a mother of two, a wife. Um, I sit on various, uh, several elder councils and um, really stay close to what I'm being called to do. And what that is, is to inspire and help people to discover and trust their gifts so that they can be a life-giving force to themselves, to other people, and to all our relatives including the earth. And of course, with anything that you do, you have to start with yourself. So that's an ongoing process for me, uh, continuing learning and growing. I'm also, so I'm a consultant trainer, all those things, but I also am an author of eight books, the eighth one coming out in September. And the one that inspired this podcast is The Four Sacred Gifts, Indigenous Wisdom for Modern Times. And it was based on a prophecy that Don Coyas, a Mohican elder, and 27 elders from around the world brought to us in the mid-90s because spirit had said that the two legs, as the human beings, had forgotten how to be in harmony and balance with ourselves, with other people, with the earth and spirit. And so they gathered and they put these four gifts in uh, this eagle hoop, and it so changed my life when I heard that prophecy that I began immediately incorporating those gifts into all the work that I do with leaders around and their teams around the world. And the other part of that is that these sacred gifts, you're a sacred gift. We're all sacred gifts. And but however, we don't always operate in sacred ways. So we need to remember, we have to remember how to create this harmony and balance and how to be one with the earth because she's been talking to us for a long time and telling us that we need to remember and take care of ourselves and each other and the earth. So that's a part of what started this um, this podcast because it just really is in line with um, taking the message out of having people understand that there is a lot to be learned from each other. Um, and, and specifically in indigenous people from all over the world, you know, we our voices, um, we need to amplify them because mostly they have been mute. And it's very important because, just one example, 80% of the world's most biodiverse lands left on this earth are lands that indigenous people are on. Now, we're 6% of the world's population, but 80% of the most biodiverse places left are indigenous people live on. Well, that's not a coincidence. It's because we've been We've been taught from the very beginning how to live with in relationship, that we are part of nature, part of earth, part of each other, that everything is intimately interconnected. And that whole illusion of separateness, it just doesn't exist. And so that's what this podcast is due, to amplify those voices and also to bring to you lots of different voices from all over the world. So you'll be hearing from uh, Maori elders and healers, uh, uh, different tribes from Australia, the Sami uh, from Northern Europe, a uh, grandmother and and all the work that she's doing from South Africa, uh, Bantu uh, leader and what the gifts that they are bringing. And um, on and on, a Totec Otomi elder who is just incredible work. So you'll be hearing here at this podcast all the different uh, from around the world will continue to move in different places um, to have bring to you the knowledge, the stories, the wisdom from people who have held on to their cultural traditions, the original knowledge, and stayed close to community, and who are excellent in what they're doing and the contributions they're making. So uh, I also hope that with all of this that it will inspire you, um, have you think uh, have you learn and grow and perhaps to get an even more conscious action. And when I say that, I hope that for you, that's what I'm getting from it. And so I hope that more and more uh, to, to be able to do that. 
Now, the other thing that I want to say is that the wisdom, the knowledge that I've gotten from Indigenous people has helped me in a profound way to deal with childhood abuse, to deal with the murder that was racially related of my father, and all different kinds of things. But it has been what I, just a foundation to help me to live the fullest life ever. And so with that, I want to share with you that uh, what's coming through to me from my grandmother, my second grandmother. And it's a story that I experienced. At, I was age four, and my two sisters were with me also. We spent the night at grandmother's house, which is not that unusual. And she told us, though, the next morning that we would wake up before the sunrise. And every hour we would sit, stand by her garden. And for five minutes, we'd be quiet every hour. And so we did that because we do with like what her grandmother said. She was always so wonderful. So we went out in the dark and indeed the sun rose and we're standing there next to her garden where there was lots of sunflowers. And you can imagine what happened all day. We just kept doing what the sunflowers are doing, which was turning towards the sun, turning towards the light. And then when it got dark at night, we went in, had dinner, and then she said, she waved us. She spoke, mostly spoke Spanish. We're going out again. So she grabbed a flashlight. She didn't turn it on. We just all held hands and went out and we know we were going by the garden again. And she turned the light on to the ground and we were standing there in circle facing each other. And then she took the flashlight and pointed it over to the sunflowers and the sunflowers were facing each other. And that, that is just one of many stories that I have that have uh, fulf are fulfilling my life now, even today, because even these darkest times that we're experiencing, we know that we're meant to be here because not only do we have the sun and all the other relatives that are giving us life, but we also have light in each other's. And so at this time, we need to look to each other and join together with all our relatives to make this a thriving place for us for our children, our children's children, for other species' children, for generations and generations to come. So I just want, I'm very excited for this podcast, Sacred Gifts. I, I invite you to join us. Please come. You will love the people, the conversations we will have. I am clear about that. Goodbye. I'm delighted that all of you are here uh, to listen to this wonderful guest of mine, um, someone who I consider a sister, even though biologically she is not. Uh, Donna Carriage is a Maori healer from New Zealand. Her tribes are Nagati Tahinga and Nagati Mahuta. She is the founder and director of Aura New Zealand, a company she established 20 years ago to protect and nurture traditional Maori healing practices. She strives to honor her obligations to her teachers, to share and keep alive ancient well-being principles in a relevant, safe, and respectful way for the benefit of all people, but especially for our future generations that inhabit this earth and their evolving needs. Rongoa, and please forgive me, and she will correct all the, make sure we hear the correct pronunciation, is the oldest healing practice in a Atora, New Zealand. It combines art and science in pursuit of nurturing the well-being of both people and planet. Both are in constant state of change, and so too their relationships with each other. However, Rongoa Mari will forever remain anchored deep with the lone, the, the lore of nature, gently guiding our way in a modern world. All right. And I'm going to say that Donna is a trainer and advocate of the ancient healing art advising a number of New Zealand universities, research, professional, and private training organizations, and has served on a number of national health authority expert advisory groups representing the practice of Rangoa. And I also know her because she sits on several elder councils that I do. One is the Wellbeing Project. The other is the um, Earth, FireEarth.com, um, isn't it? FireEarth.com. And um, is there another one? We're also on one. Now I'm forgetting. Yeah, there's an, uh, something coalition. Yes, there is. Yeah, so I think it's 
I want to see her. She is busy. <laughs> and so before I go any further, they need to hear from you, Donna. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And please just tell us a bit about who you are, your ancestral roots, just so we can begin to get to know you before we get it even further into a conversation. Well, kia ora. That, that's our greeting term here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kia ora and Nita. It's lovely to be here with you. I'm so excited. You know, we see each other on the other councils. It's just so lovely to have a have a nice, relaxed conversation and just share who we are. So thank you for making that possible. Um, to all of those people out there, my name is Donna Kerridge. I hail from Aotearoa, New Zealand, so we're at the bottom of the earth, or the top if you turn it up the other way. <laughs> um, I belong to the Indigenous people here, um, uh, Māori, we call ourselves Māori, which is a collection of different peoples who arrived on this land round about the same time and we intermarried and then we became Māori after arriving here. Prior to that, we were different Polynesian people looking for a better life. And when we arrived here in Aotearoa, we started to mix, intermarry, raise new generations of shared ancestry. And that is how we became Māori. But also, I have an ancestry that harks back to the Celtic region. So I am the firstborn of um, my father's family, which hail from the north of England, here in Aotearoa. So that's really exciting to walk in both worlds, to uh, walk in the footsteps of, of the colonisers, the, the people who arrived much after, much later than the indigenous. Um, and that has been a real privilege. It has been a privilege to be able to walk in both worlds. Oh. So, yeah. So that's me. I practice Rungwa Māori. Um, I am a practitioner, have been for decades. More recently, so probably in the last 20 years, have um, really stepped into the space of advocating for our traditional practices and ensuring that we retain the authenticity while adapting to the demands of a modern world. So both are really important to hold on to those things that are that anchor us, but allow us to flex in order to meet the needs that we have and our future generations have. So yeah. and that's, that's me. time. So I love the, the two of the things that you um, many things that you just said to us. We're getting further, but that you are you own, which I am seeing more and more of people. We're all finding out who we are, and and you could say they didn't. The colonizers didn't make it easy, but that you are both a Maori but you also are Celtic um, from the northern part. And I always put down that I'm Nawa, which is Aztec and Toltec, but I also am um, from Hungary and Spain. And uh, and lately, I just learned that I'm part of the Amazon, come from there as well. So once you do our DNA in that, you get to see, but all the stories uh, that lay in, lie within us anyway need to come out. Um, and then I really, really want uh, your, when I, I read a paper of yours, I just want to say, uh, this is not a quiz for you because I know you've probably read a lot of things, but what I really love is for you to talk a little bit more about that. You're, you're really rooted in the traditions and keeping those alive, but also able to flex. It's evolving with, with the modern day. So it, it's so it's it's able to you're able to bridge in a big way is what I I see it too and get the fullest from people so please if you could tell us a little bit about more about especially this time when people are so well-being is a big issue they're so struggling with so many things physically psychologically mentally emotionally and then the earth all the the horrible things that are happening with our dear mother earth um, tell us a little bit about what it is your practice and what why we need to know this for our well-being. Wow, that's a pretty good question. I know, and I'll be quiet for a while. <laughs> Take whatever you want. <laughs> I couldn't agree more that now is a real time of turmoil 
you know, on a daily basis, I'm seeing much more anxiety than I have in the past. And it comes from all walks of life, whether that be a corporate world, we're nervous, we're worried, whether that be in our own personal lives. Um, you know, we certainly are seeing a lot more people um, presenting with anxiety, with what others refer to as mental health issues. Um, and we're also seeing the devastation and the inability of our planet to rejuvenate, to refresh itself so that, you know, we can be well. So I agree totally with um, your synopsis of the, you know, the times that we're facing now. You know, my thoughts are that what this is doing or what it's identified or uncovered is that we've lost our roots. If we're trying to heal a plant, for an example, or a tree, and we can see all the physical things that might be wrong with it, it might have a fungus on its bark or it might have broken in the wind or things like that. We know how to patch that up. We know how to mend that. But if the plant is becoming unwell from within the inside, we look to the roots and what is being taken in by the roots in order to heal that plant. We need to do the same for ourselves. We need to look to our roots to find our healing. And and so that's where I think the answers are. You know, I look at modern medicine and all the gifts that modern medicine brings to the world. And there are very few of us who at some point in our life will not be grateful for the gift that medicine brings. Whether that's for us, for our parents, or for our grandchildren, it is a true gift. But so too are indigenous ways of knowing. They're in a, they're in a different space. They're, they come at it from a different value system. We come at it from, from another way of knowing. And it's no greater and no less than the current system. It is equally as valuable. And I think that because many of us have lost our connection with Mother Earth, with the, with the landscape, what we're seeing now is the result of that. And so if I were to look at all the people who've come to seek my help or my advice over the years, and they have reoccurring patterns that are you know, troubling them, I've noticed that there's like basically four categories that that our um, people are struggling with. And if I were to name them, yes, please. Number do. one would be loneliness. Mm-hmm. Loneliness. I'm seeing lots of loneliness around the around the planet, and you know sometimes that's just because we've, you know, we've had an indigres- indiscretion. And we don't know how to fix it, so we withdraw and we become lonely. We live not on our ancestral lands anymore. We live away from our kith and kin. And we can live in large apartment blocks and not know another person in our block. Whereas when you live in community, you are much more um you are much more connected. So you know, there's real disconnection comes from loneliness. The second thing is hopelessness. I'm seeing that people are starting to lose hope at a really fast rate. And, you know, when we dwell in the place of hopelessness, we believe that there's nothing better coming. This is where we see our addictions. This is where we see our suicides. And, you know, here in Aotearoa, Māori top the list. Māori top the list for suicides and for addictions. And, you know, this is what happens when we become disconnected from our roots, from Mother Earth and from our cultures. The third thing is what I call homelessness. And I don't mean a physical house. I mean knowing where home is, knowing where you belong, so that no matter what you may have done, no matter the terrible things that you may have done in your life, nobody can move you on because you belong. And lots and in, in Aotearoa, in Te Reo Māori, in the Māori language, we refer to that as our tūra, tūranga waiwai, our place to stand, no matter what. 
So lots of us don't know where that is anymore. We're city born and bred. We don't know where the bones of our people lie anymore. That's the place that we belong. So, you know, that leads to some of these feelings. But the one that stands out most for me and that I am seeing in our young people is that we are not taught and it is not reinforced what our individual gifts are that we bring to the world. Mm. So, you know, does a child really know what their gift is? Our elders would watch a child for a moment and they would see the gifts that each and every child had and they would connect them with others in their area, in their tribal nation who could foster that skill, who could help them grow it. But if you're disconnected from your people, if people are not speaking these things to our children about their gifts, we can see the way a child places their hand on a person, whether or not or that they have a healing gift. We see the way a little child can pick up a, a bumblebee and not be stung and know that they have a gift with animals. We can see a child who has the gift of a beautiful voice and we can see how that voice is meant to heal. But we're not telling our children. We're telling them they're good at everything. We're telling them that they're amazing, but we are telling them nothing. We are not telling them, your gift, my dear, is definitely healing. Your gift is the gift of that beautiful voice that you use when your grandparents are unwell. You sing them back to wellness. That's beautiful. I can I can just hear it. Go ahead and finish. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, you know, it's those four things. Yes. And if we want to heal ourselves and we want to heal the world, because remember, we can't be well unless our mother is well. The people will not be well unless the land is well. And if you want to know the health and well-being of a people, you look to the health and well-being of the land. So if we want to be well, if we want to um, help others be well, because our wellness depends on the wellness of our community and of our land. So it's not about just healing ourselves. It is about healing our community and the lands that we live upon. And as a result, we are well. So when I translate that from that big picture down to us as individuals, I think what we need to be doing more of is ensuring that we are inclusive rather than exclusive. That's how we address loneliness. I think that we need to start to make sure that we put some energy into inspiring hope in others. That, that helps address the, the sense of hopelessness that people have when we, em, when we embrace addictions, when we start to consider um, and contemplate ending things because we see no hope. I think it's also important to ensure that we make others welcome. We allow them to be home with us in our communities. And that we are we ensure that not only with our children, but with our colleagues and our friends, that we remind them of the gifts that they bring to our lives. And if we did all of those things, then we, our communities, and our land would be better. So I think, yeah, from a healing perspective, that is a very indigenous perspective. And no matter where I've traveled, and I've been fortunate enough to meet the Toltec people, and work some time in Mexico with both the Mayan and the Toltec yes. um, healers, I have learnt that our cultures, despite different words, share the same fundamental principles in what is required in order to heal our planet and heal our people. And that's how I know they're authentic. When we deviate, we're moving into more recent man-made um, views and cultures but it is our indigenous that will help us reconnect to who we are and I think 
it's really important to remind people, especially here in Aotearoa, where, you know, we are the minority population. We only make up 15% of our population. So that means that quite often, you know, we have 85% of our pop- population who may or may not know their roots, may or may not be connected to their roots. And so I really want to remind everybody that we are all Indigenous to somewhere. Some of us have just become disconnected. And I think that it is the job of all of us to help encourage others to reconnect to their roots, even if it is through the roots of the land that you now reside on. That's what I want you to say more about. I can just imagine the people watching and listening saying, but I don't know. I don't know. And and that having community that showed you who your gifts are when you were saying that made me think about my grandmother who, you know, she would have us come on Sundays. I have 121st cousins. And she would always have a chance to hug each one of us coming in and going out, cooking in between. But she would always take my hand. I remember it as early as as three years old, and she did it until the day she died. And she would trace this, and she'd go, tu eres la una, tu eres la una. Your gift, your, your, and then she'd tell me what my gift was. She said, you are the one. You are healing to bring the hearts and minds of people together. And you do it like the flowers do. And you know, and and not including every one of the flowers, I go, oh, the rose don't say, oh, I don't want the sunflowers here, or you know, but it's about all of it needing to be there. But I do want to raise the question: so, when if someone comes to you and um, you see that um, they don't have an indigenous community, um, but they really are yearning to understand who they are and what they are, how do they even begin to? to share what you did in these four things of, you know, what go to their roots and so that they don't experience at least as long and as much the loneliness, the hopelessness, the homelessness. I love the way you talked about that. And then the care about about Mother Earth. I know so many who who do care. But how what what is it that you would share with them of where do you get started? So a couple of things that help me see the light go on in people is when I remind them that they are the living face of their ancestors. You know, we are those people and they are us. So you haven't lost it. You've just forgotten it. It resides, all of that knowledge resides in your bones. And there are things that we all know that we know we've never been taught, but we know them. Where do we think that comes from? We are the living face of our ancestors. And their knowledge and their wisdom and their care walks with us every day. For us living in a modern world, sometimes we're just a little too busy to hear. And until we slow down, we are not going to hear the whispers of our ancestors. Until we start to reconnect to the natural world, both physically and spiritually, we aren't going. We can't hear them. We need to spend more time in nature. We need to spend more time in just being rather than always doing. And then we will hear the whispers of our ancestors. And in the meantime, how about I just share yours until the voice of mine become clear? Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, And I know that you're speaking where most tribes are. Very few are exclusive. You know, that's just, they really want to help people um, to do that. And it's just critical. And I I was going to say, um, use as an example, when I said at the beginning that um, I really honor you and embracing all your ancestry and that I embrace mine, but and still learning a, a lot about them. But the universe also provides, that's that, spiritual unseen part and just quickly i want to say and then get into another question for you is that um i have since 2005 been going to the sacred headwaters of the amazon and then i began leading journeys in 2012 not not knowing why i was so drawn to go there and it's a lot of extra work to put everything together for you know people to go down but i go and i just love being with the people there in a place that feels so different and yet i felt at home and lo and behold, during COVID, when I did the 23andMe, the 
genetic stuff, there it is, 15% of my indigeneity, which I knew I was half, comes from the Amazon. There are no stories. So I'm sharing that because for those of you who may be going, but I don't even know where to begin, I think Donna just told us where to begin. And even if you just listen and follow your heart, your guts, your passion, because sometimes the head uh, can mix you up. But if you follow that, the universe provides. I mean, those plants were calling me. I know that my ancestors. And so through dreaming and just asking, um, slowing down and asking, I just think it's beautiful what you're saying. And uh, I'm so glad that you were with the, the Mayan and the Toltec. Um, I, I love going down and, and visiting my communities and that. It's wonderful. So um, I also know that folks are going to want to know, you you talk about um, really reconnecting with nature and in not only for the physical, but for the spiritual. And I think we're at a time, part of the separation that people have had because of some of the teachings and the forgetting, forgetting of who we are and what we are, is that spiritual. What do you mean when you talk about, you know, reconnecting in the spiritual way? So I think officially, I think it's the difference between thinking and knowing. So um, when you feel something, you know it. You can't ever forget it. So it's feeling our way back into our cultures that is really important. And, you know, if you subscribe to the school of thought um, around um, the spiritual aspects of ourselves, we have lots of really well-respected models of health, indigenous models of health that we see touted through throughout universities, throughout academic learning and things like that. But for me, and I don't speak for all Māori by any means, but for me, it's fairly simple. Our model of health is both physical and spiritual. And I don't see mental health as a separate thing. It either falls into the spiritual realm or the physical realm. And here in Aotearoa, we have a, um, we use an analogy of kauwairunga, kauwairaro. Kauwairunga being the upper jaw, kauwairaro being the lower jaw, the one that flaps all the time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> As an extrovert. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So the, so the bottom jaw is representative of the physical in our world. The top jaw, which remains rooted in place, is representative of the spiritual realm. And the two are essential to achieve the function of people and or the mouth. So it, it's, the two are essential elements. And we have a... Um, I can only use our words here, so I'm sorry for those of you who don't understand them. I'll try to explain as best I can in English, but it's really hard to take um, the concepts of one culture and give them due credit by it's changing Please feel language. free to say it in your language. And then Thank you. just whatever that is. That's really important. Okay. So we have this concept of Modi, which for me is the whole goal of our healing practices, is to lift the the energy, the vitality of and the the importance or the esteem of both people in place. That is the goal. It's not to heal disease. We in the modern world we think healing is about healing disease. But in our indigenous world, we look to healing the vitality of people in place. And so Modi is sometimes translated as life essence, life force, vitality, those kinds of things, for want of another word. So to me, the Modi is what we are lifting. Now, I have a beautiful nephew who explained his perspective on this. I won't claim it as my own. It's far too beautiful for me to claim. But he talks about every person that we meet emits a light of some sort. And sometimes 
that's reflective of a candle that sits deep within our abdomen. And sometimes that candle light shines brightly and sometimes not so. That light is the reflection of the modi that exists within that person. And a person with a strong modi are the people we like to get close to because we can feel that wellness transmitting to us. We just naturally want to lean in to those people. But there are people whose light doesn't shine quite so brightly. Their candlelight has been dimmed for any number of reasons. And we go in and out of shining brightly and not so. The goal of our healing art is to brighten that light. Technically and physically, we understand Modi to be the glue between the physical aspects of ourselves and the spiritual aspects of ourselves. And sometimes, throughout our life, throughout the course of life events, that glue becomes a little bit unstable and doesn't stick together, maintaining the balance quite so well. So we use our indigenous healing practices to um, re-stick, to make that glue stronger, the bond stronger between the physical and the spiritual, thereby healing us. It has very little to do with disease. You can liken it to our backbone or our tuara. Um, if you can see that as a zip, you see our spine as a zip, and you can think of Modi as the spine, that which glues the left half to the right half. And in Te Ao Māori, in the Māori world, the left is our spiritual side or our um, ancestral side in there. Um, and the right being our physical selves. But you, you use the spine as the analogy of Modi and that it keeps those two together and bound strongly. Therefore, we are well, despite disease. But from time to time on a zipper, the teeth can become a little bit crooked. And our indigenous healing practices help straighten them up so that the zipper can move more smoothly. So that's at the heart of it. And you, you can't be completely physically well if your spiritual wellness is out of kilter and vice versa. So Rungo Māori is about maintaining the balance so that we can be well. And wellness has nothing, in my view, to do with disease. We do have amazing techniques, having been close to the land, to work out how to fix a sprained ankle, to help you sleep better when you're troubled, all of those things. But they're the easy bits. They're the bits we can just give you a recipe for and off you go, and it's wonderful. But it is about when we talk about the loneliness, the hopelessness, the homelessness and those things, that's about restoring balance. That's about translating how we can enhance, how we can straighten up teeth on a zipper, how we can make the candlelight shine brighter and and restore balance. We all know people who... um, who have lots of physical ailments and and old as well. And, you know, our elders here, I'm often reminding them of, you really can't go out today. It's quite wet and cold. You will get sick if you go out today dressed like that. And they'll go, I have to look after the old people. And quite often I have to remind them, you are the old people. Those are the people whose modi is strong despite all their ailments. Their modi is strong. And for me, there's real beauty, and I can cite an example of one of our elders here in Aotearoa who was unwell due to heart failure. And we were caring for him in his final weeks, and he was adamant that he would require no help to shower, thank you, young lady, and I will need no help to go to the bathroom, young lady, I will manage those things myself. And I was quite happy for him to manage those things. And one day he said to us, to his children and to I, I want to go to the ocean. Take me to the ocean. And we took him to the ocean. And he said, take me up that mountain so that I can see my land. And we took him up that mountain. And he sat quietly and contemplated. And then he asked us to take him to the forest. 
So we took him to the forest and he said, thank you, take me home. And we took him home and we put him into bed and he said, that's it, no more water, no more pills, no more food, I'm happy. By 10 o'clock the next morning, he had transitioned into the spiritual world, happy and healthy by our Indigenous standards. Now that is Indigenous healing at its best. Yes, and thank you for sharing that because so much what I hear from people is with being um, the fear rising so much with war and everything going on, not only outside but inside themselves is what you're talking about, is that hearing the stories of we all are going to die, but it doesn't have to be. It can be in a good way, a beautiful uh, my mother had a beautiful death. And, and when I say that, a lot of people are like, what is, like, no, it was absolutely, she'd been dreaming it for two years. And it happened exactly the last five days, exactly like she said. And it was just beautiful. There was nothing. And he, even at the end, I hear from what you've been sharing with us, um, shared with all the living, again, that it's always being in connection. He wanted the ocean, the forest. You know, just all the elements being back together. And then with that fullness, knowing that he is part of that, he could rest. He could transition what we call the other side of the camp. Um, because, of course, spiritual, we know that he's always here. Yeah. Sometimes it's even stronger on how he fills our hearts. So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I'm not going to say I'm sorry for the loss because no. it was meant to happen, right? There's nothing to be sorry about. <laughs> it's really great. So let, let's... um Gosh, I know that people's questions are going to have all sorts of things they're going to want to know how to find you. So I will just say now, but we'll have it in writing too, that you can go to, you correct me if I'm wrong, Aura, O-R-A, New Zealand.com, O-R-A, New Zealand.com. And you will find there beautiful information about what um, uh, Donna is talking about and also just some writing and papers too. And it's beautiful. I know how to get a hold of her to find out more. So I know that uh, folks will want to also know a little bit more about, um, you know, how do you how do you apply this in the when you go into business or corporations? Because I did see um, you're like me in that way, but I'm always eager to hear, and and other people are too. Like in places that people think are totally have forgotten and are starting to lose hope that they could ever remember. What is it? How how do you do that? How do you go into business leaders and and share the wisdom you're talking about? Well, firstly, I think the key is to ensure that what you're sharing is personally relevant to the people with which you're sharing it. When thing only when things are personally relevant can they become professional. Otherwise, we're just paying lip service. So it's talk to the people. Talk to the people, not the corporation. When you talk to the people and they and and what you're sharing is personally relevant to them, they know how to apply that to their corporate world. They know how to provide it to their tribe, which may be a corporation. They know how to help their people discover their indigeneity and use that as a tool and a strength to contribute to the goals of the community, the corporation, or the family. So whatever it is, the rules don't change because we move into a um, a place different to our own. You know, as, as people, you can see the light go on when they start to discover and appreciate because we've been taught to think rather than to know. There you are. And when we allow ourselves to know what we know, what resides deep within our bones, in all of our bones, that we have this whole part of ourselves that we have disconnected from over time, that it's still sitting there waiting. And for me, I truly believe that now is the time and never before has this knowledge been so important this indigenous knowledge that our ancestors, all of our ancestors, have preserved in our traditions, in our songs, in our prayers, in our stories, 
waiting patiently for the day when we need it most. And that that whole toolbox is sitting there waiting to be brought out into the open so that we can change or enhance the trajectory that we are on at the moment. And I think that when we when we we come to know these things, they're very easy to apply in the modern world because they're all about the law, L-O-R-E, that underpins life. And we can outlaw, L-A-W, as much as we like as human beings, that doesn't change the L-O-R-E. And that is what we're missing, is the L-O-R-E of life and well-being of our planet and the people who reside on it. And I, uh, I'm excited that there is this amazing pool of knowledge and wisdom that is accessible by every single human on the planet. And sometimes I need to see what's in your box, in your toolbox, so I can be excited about mine and go find it. And so, <laughs> yeah, I'm, and you talked before briefly, sorry to go off on a tangent, I do that often, but you talked briefly before about discovering that you were Amazon uh, or from the Amazon. And I can really vividly remember when a beautiful um, organization, I'd been talking to my husband about a trip we were contemplating with our children and our grandchildren. And we're both a little less enthusiastic than we might have been because, you know, we had been to this place several times before and we wanted to discover something new. But the children know they wanted to go to this one particular place. And we asked each other, so if we had all the money in the world and there were no limitations, where on where would we choose to go as individuals? And he was really keen to learn and to take me and to show me the wonders in Canada. And I said to him, you know, and I, I apologize profusely for my ignorance. And I said to him, I would like to meet the Mayan people. And he said, where are they? And I went, I have no idea. But I know I want to meet them. And I kid you not, within half an hour, the phone rang. And on the phone was a person who said, am I speaking to Donna Kerridge? I said, yes. Well, we have an organisation that would like to invite you to come and work with the Mayan and the Toltec healers in Mexico. Everything's paid for. There is one catch, however, you will need to leave within the next two weeks. And I got off the phone and I said to my husband, you're never going to believe. And then, like you, 10 years later, and the update in technology, and I see that I have my heritage. There you go. I didn't and know I, that. I, I know that. And so our ancestors walk with us all the time. If we dare to express our longing and our need for a certain thing, almost scarily, the world provides. There you go. You just lifted the hope or the hopelessness of perhaps some people listening, because it really is when you're when you express that and put that out uh, into the universe, it's not just woo woo. It does come back in in all different sorts of ways. And we know now with even science that there's this whole thing that happens too. So now that's just a we don't need affirmation, but that just fits with what we've been taught all along of what it's like. Uh, which is quite incredible. That's beautiful. I'm so glad. And see, we are sisters. Uh, oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, we do have, I feel, we do have that. Yes. I feel so so I hope all of, yes. I hope all of you are listening to all of this. I know you are and taking note because part of it is what I hear you saying, and it's so beautifully the way you say that. It's, it's not to stop thinking. We need the thinking brain. However, it's not leave from that. Go into your heart, go into your guts, you know, where the knowing happens, well, listen to your body, you know, and so that takes some quiet. And just to do that, because we've disconnected from our own bodies, too. And then we are able to have what you talk about is, if, if I got it right, the Maori, the light, the connecting of the physical and the spiritual together. I love that. That's, uh, and I know that what 
people who have been watching and listening can see that you have quite a bright light, uh, that your Māori is very, very strong. And so I'm happy about that. Um, I do want to ask a few more questions for the last 10, 15 minutes that we have together. I know there's so many that um, that people would probably be coming up with. But one of them, I, I just would like to um, ask you some some things that seem light, but I think are important. Like, what's your favorite food? What do you eat? <laughs> what do you like to eat? <laughs> well, I think I think that we are either mountain people, we are forest people, or we are ocean people. And that is our place of peace. And sometimes we're a combination of both, but there's always one that is dominant. And I often think our food is connected to that. Mm -hmm. So my favorite foods are seafood. And while I spend an awful lot of my time um, helping people connect through the language of the land, I am a sea person through and through. And seafoods, uh, I can't think of a single seafood that I don't like. (laughs) So that's good. Yeah. So if anyone ever goes and visits you, uh, oh. goes to work with you, then no, no, what seafood is always going to work. <laughs> I always put it on my list when people go, do you have any special dietary requirements? And I'm sure they're expecting me to say, oh, I'm vegan or I'm this or I'm that. And I go, yes, please, seafood. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm glad to hear that. And that, again, it seems like a, a little question. It actually is. It's about really honoring everything that goes into the the, the whole thing taking care of the ocean and the fish and then they, they're taking care of us and the whole reciprocity and, and things. So also, um, I want to ask you, what do you, what are you dreaming about now? Like what is, what is a dream that you want us all to hear that you have? I, uh, for my tradition too, that the uh, dreams are meant to be shared. We would, since I was three, I would, my grandmother and my mom, they'd always have us share our dreams because they'd say, once you put them out there, even if you don't, but if, then even more and more, they, they're they alive, you know? So let's, I would love to hear what is your dream or dreams that are happening now? My dreams are for the human race to know that we are part of, to remember that we are part of nature. We are not separate to nature, nor are we in charge of nature. And that by assuming our place within the world, that we understand as a species that we are entitled, every single one of us on the planet, are entitled to enough in order that we be well. No more, no less. And when we learn that, our whole way of being on the planet shifts. Um, These are really um, amazing principles from a movement here in Aotearoa um, called the T.Y. Walker Movement. They are really, really important for helping ground us as a species. And so when when we learn our place, the amazing thing that we learn, we are the youngest in the um in the natural world. We are the youngest of the species in the natural world. And just like in our families, you know, we often think of the youngest as the most spoiled. The world revolves around them. Anything they want, they have. Um, and they kick up a hell of a fuss when things don't work their way. Well, as a species, we are the youngest in the world. And we have been behaving exactly like that. However, Those youngest, spoilt, entitled brats grow up one day and their gift to the family is that they care for their elders. You look inside any family, that the gift of the youngest in the family generally works out to be caring for the elders, their elder siblings, their parents, their elders at the end of their days. When the human species start to appreciate our place in the ecosystem, as the youngest, we refer to them as the portiki, we can step into our gift. And our gift is to care for Mother Earth, Papa Tunuku in our language. That is our gift. And it's time we grew up, that we stopped behaving like the spoiled little brats of the planet 
where everything was put here for our exclusive benefit, not the benefit of our brothers and sisters in the natural world. We don't get to have and consume all the things that they need to be well. But once we know our purpose and our gift, which is to heal the land, to heal the natural world, then we can feel really good about taking up space and oxygen on our planet. Mm. How to do I can I can feel and sense that people are taking in that dream and hopefully are expanding that out of themselves because that means we're all getting, as we talk about it, in right relation uh, with everything. And when you talk about the human supremacy, um, I know I, I people can get really down and stuff. However, I love the way you talk about and when we mature, and it doesn't mean it has to take us a long time to mature. I know some pretty, pretty mature little people <laughs> that are telling the adults, sure. hey, you no, this is not what I've been taught at school, or why would you do that? Even little or before preschool and saying, why would you be mean to that that animal? Or why are you being mean to that bug? And all of that. So that there is a knowing that can be fully embraced again for all of us. So thank you for sharing your dream. Uh, um, for the last um, five or six minutes that we have, I want you to to share anything that you want to share or a question that you wish, gosh, I wish Anita would ask this, or I'm feeling called to share this that's happening. So whatever is on, on the screen for you in your heart. Well, while what I say might sound perfect in a wonderful world, the reality is that I'm way too busy doing to feel these days. And I guess that, you know, it is a constant challenge to balance um, ourselves in the modern world. I liken it to, you know, when you go to the gym and they have those wobble boards that, you know, you have Someone's to like fall off. No. <laughs> yeah, all Um. And the whole idea is to try and strengthen all those little muscles that help you maintain your balance. And the way that you do it is to keep your eye on a fixed point, and that helps you balance better. But the trouble is, we live in a constantly changing world, and so if we're trying to make, if we're trying to maintain balance in a constantly um, changing world, and we're looking at the physical aspects of the world, it's very hard to maintain balance, and we fall off and we get on again. And we fall off and we get on again. And the reality is that's my life, is that um, from some, sometimes I'm able to be perfectly balanced and I can, things flow and I can hear my ancestors talking to me. Um, I get myself into very complex situations sometimes with some really difficult challenges and I really don't know where to start. I just want to throw my hands in the air and go, I have no idea how to help you solve that problem. But I've learned my fixed space, my fixed space on the horizon is my culture. And so when I get into the space of I don't know where, I don't know how, I just have this conversation with the ancestors that I've met in my lifetime, but who are now have now crossed that veil. And I just talk to them and I just go, here's the problem. What would you do? And, you know, I don't know whether they're smiling or slapping my head because their answer is always very direct, very succinct, with very few words. So, you know, uh, one of the examples is people say, should we be sharing with all the appropriation and the exploitation of indigenous knowledge, should we be sharing that outside our cultures? And we can see those examples of exploitation um, going on, and there's a temptation to kind of contract and and keep that knowledge close in order to protect it and keep it safe. And I don't ever think that there's an excuse for being careless with these treasures that our ancestors have left us. But when I asked that question of my ancestors, I got a very clear answer from my grandfather, who I was fortunate enough to know, to say, Donna, if they need feeding, feed them. If they need healing and you can heal them, heal them. 
It doesn't matter from where they come. So, you know, those are the things that that help me maintain balance. But I'm by no means perfect. And so it is that constant shifting in and out of balance. As the world changes, we have to find a new balance. And as it, you know, and we have to do that every second of every day. But my constant uh, are my ancestors, my my culture. They are my constant. Yeah, I love that about you. you. <laughs> I love that about you. You have humility. And uh, what I found, and I'm sure you have too, is when we talk to folks who are elders, and elders doesn't just mean an age, because you can have someone who's young who's an elder, um, is that there is a humility. And so it's not about saying perfect uh, or even excellent time. But the thing is, when you fall off, when you fall out of balance, you don't stay there very long. You get back because of that center thing. I've been talking about it like, ah, you know, I want people to see Anita just doesn't have great earrings and jewelry and all these books I read. Sometimes my hair is sticking right out. It's unkempt. I'm not sure. And the not sure is an acknowledgement that, wait, I'm not part of this whole hoop of life. And there is both the seen and unseen that I can get back in centered with. And those ancestors, I agree with you so much. So I am hoping there's so much that we learned from you today. And I'm hoping that everyone um, uh, will be able to play it a second or a third time if they want, if they didn't take notes, uh, because all of it is very useful at a time when people are sincere about wanting the change, something different, not only for themselves, but for their children and other species children. And that always makes me smile when they add in, you know, they want all of that for all the children because we are part of all the children. So it's just really, really wonderful. So uh, the last question I have is to, if you could share a little bit about what it is that you, you, you have shared a lot about what you do, but how do people get in touch with you? Uh, if you have any special projects that you're working on right now, um, if you could share some of that, then we can make sure that everybody knows how to find you and can listen with the softest part of the ears about what you're up to that they could support. Well, I think, you know, it's really important for us that um, that we start with ourselves first and foremost. We often try to start with government. And I think, you know, we change ourselves and our thoughts and others do the same, then our thoughts become popular. And as our thoughts become popular, they become the thoughts of the government. So don't start with the government, start with ourselves. And that there are some wonderful organisations that we are both part of, the Wellbeing Project, the Fire Circle. These are really good um, projects and things that I'm really happy to continue to support and invest energy in because it is about inclusivity not about exclusivity and I think that you know we do not need to think broader than our own shores and we need to think people not countries not anything like that and we are all people so those are the things that I love about those those um, projects that we're both involved with is that they are respectful and inclusive of different ways of problem solving of um, coming up with initiatives that help people grow. So I'm really happy about that. We, in um, a couple of months' time, so in February next year, we are launching an online um, training program for people to learn about indigeneity through a Māori lens, because that's all I can talk to. Um, and so they can do that online. It's... Um, we're really looking forward to sharing that with people around the world. And hopefully from sharing that, people will go, oh my goodness, now I know why my French ancestors find this so important or that so important or why my Scottish ancestors find this important and that important or my American ancestors, my First Nation people, why they find these things so important. Um. And so I'm hoping that that's the spark, that's the potential for helping others reconnect to their indigeneity. Yeah. So that's what I'm passionate about. That's what um, I'm investing a lot of energy in right now. Um, but for the balance, 
um, it's also investing opportunity, investing in opportunities like this to connect with like-minded people like yourself around the world because that's what feeds our souls as we attempt to feed the souls of others is by staying in touch with other people, other like-minded souls so that they can help and we can collectively help brighten our lives. Well, I know that a lot of people who have been watching and listening to us are very excited that you indeed have already done that today. And and now they have ways through Fire Circle Earth and as well as going to Aura, O-R-A, New Zealand.com. They'll probably can find there, learn about uh, classes coming up. And it is a time to remember that that we are all connected. And in, in a way, um, for me, that's what always reminds me you know, this loneliness, that's a human condition can happen, but I'm never alone. I have more than enough. And then, so I don't have to take too much because I already have enough with just being. So thank you so much, Donna, your your wisdom. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again in our councils where we are together, but thank you so much for sharing your traditions, um, your personal hopes and dreams and, um, there are no words, to, you know. Thank you about so it. much. I've, I look forward to the day when we can spend some time together physically and, and catch up. Because like you, I do feel like um, there is a sisterhood that um, that we share and that it's just so comfortable and so easy. So thank you for making that a possibility. Thoroughly enjoyed it. You're welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I look forward to... Um, you coming back and listening to other elders and uh, hearing their wisdom and see how it applies to you. It's not separate from you, but can spur you on to learn, as Donna has said, about your own ancestors. So you have a wonderful day or night, whatever time it is. Thank you very much. See you next time. Thank you, Anita. Mātewā. We'll see you again. <laughs> <laughs>